刚看了你很高兴啊。他们说是呃，刚才跟我说说是这个菲特博士看起来是更绅士，我看着这个看起来是更绅士，我看着。Uh, after six months in lockdown, I can't put on a suit anymore. Oh, how about you? I'll put it on. It's perfect. 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 And full of energy, as always. Full of energy. 哎，首先应该祝贺您这个管管那个重新开馆，这是个好事情，是个好消息。Well, thank you so very much. You can't believe. Well, thank you so much. Of course, you can believe because you've gone through the same thing. You can't believe because what it feels like to open the doors again and to have visitors back. What it feels like to open the doors again and to have visitors. Visitors. For you, for us, that's our lifeblood. We are there to share the collections with them. We are there to share the collections. And it's nice. To have them back also in person and not only on the street. Also in person and not only on the street. 是的，看到经过长时间的闭馆以后啊，看到这个观众第一批观众进来，不管他是男的女的，高的矮的，胖的瘦的，漂亮的丑的，我都希望拥抱一下。Yeah, you're right. And so, what are the? Do you have limits on the number of people you can let in, or are you already so secure that there are no limits to the numbers of visitors? 它没有完全解除。其实我们经历了三个阶段，就是在呃春节这个除夕到这个四月三十号期间，我们完全闭馆嘛。五月一号正式开馆，呃，最初五月一号到六月初的时候，我们大概每天控制在三千人。但是六月份有一段时间，北京重新又发现了这个疫情以后呢，我们控制在一千人。到了七月份以后，我们放宽到平时放宽到五千人的样子。现在到周末的时候，我们大概是八千人的这个数额的限制。That's that's fantastic. We we are still with two thousand, so we 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 are very careful, and um, we, you know, visitors enter the museum, and then there's one route, a one-way route, through galleries only on ground floor. It's only on ground floor. It's not on the first floor. But they can see nine thousand objects on that route, and it is because you don't have to think about where to go because we tell you where you have to go. It frees it frees the mind, and you suddenly rediscover the objects as never before. 我完全相信你说的，呃，因为大英博物馆在这个中国的公众心目中啊，呃，有非常高的知名度。呃，我们两家博物馆的合作呢，应该说是，呃，每一次新的这个合作的进展，都会引起很大的这种社会的关注，呃，媒体也很关注。比如说，我们呃合作举办过很多的这种呃影响很大的展览，比如说二零一二年的呃六月二十二号到二零一三年的一月六号，我们跟维多利亚和埃伯特的 VA 博物馆在联合在北京办了辞职运呃大英博物馆。英国国立维多利亚与埃伯特博物馆藏瓷器精品展，呃，这个展览呢，应该说是吸引了三十五万多观众，呃，影响非常大。这是国外的呃高品质外销瓷第一次在中国展出。那么，二零一七年的三月一号到五月三十一号，那么我们举办了呃来自贵馆的这个大英博物馆一百件展品中的世界史展览，这展览展览了七十六天。呃，我看了一下，这观众数是三十四万人，呃，影响非常大。所以，大英博物馆在中国公众心目中，呃，既有比较很很高的地位，也有很大的影响，大家都很关注。呃，包括我们现在这个连线，我们即将推出这个呃藏品的介绍，呃，观众都很期待，呃，希希望能看到呃大英的珍藏。Well, it's very kind of you to say this. And... Of course, we completely reciprocate. Um, for us, it's been a great privilege and and a great pleasure uh, to work together with you and the colleagues 
um, in the National Museum. It's always uh, been a cooperation on a very high level of professionalism and, and shared interest. Um, and I think also shared interest um, for our audience, for our visitors who, who come to the museum to encounter the collections, to encounter the objects and learn something uh, and be inspired um, for their life. Because I think that's, and I know this from, from the many conversations that you and I have had over the last years, um, I think we, we really believe that um, encountering collections, be it, be it in, the, in the permanent galleries or be it, be it in the um, temporary exhibition spaces, um, allows you to make key experiences for your life when you connect with the past, when you connect with other cultures and thus, you know, other parts of the world that, that we all share. And being able to do this together for us has been a wonderful journey of, of, of discovery and a friendship. And um, I very much look forward to continuing this in the future as soon as, as, soon as the, the pandemic um, is gone and we can all move safely again. Uh, yes, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, and it's wonderful to see that all the colleagues in the British Museum are very excited about our cooperation, our long-term cooperation. Um, and of course, we should also mention that um, regularly we, we have the great pleasure of welcoming colleagues from the National Museum decide to come here over the summer and work with us and for us here at the british museum that is always a very special moment when we can share experience we can share knowledge um, we can uh, look at how we go about exhibitions how we go about research how we go about digital um, so i think our cooperation has really created a wonderful basis um, for colleagues to profit mutually um, and also to uh, to share results of research. And of course, you had this very impressive colloquium um, in 2019, where I had the, the opportunity to learn much more about the great development of museums in China, which is very impressive indeed. Um, together with colleagues from other parts of the world. Um, and looking to the future, obviously, um, I think there are many areas um, where we can simply continue and expand um, the exchange for the profit, in the end, for the profit of our audiences. And of course, your audiences, like our audiences, are international audiences. Um, here in, in the uh, British Museum, um, the fastest growing group of visitors from abroad is the Chinese. So on a normal day, um, before the pandemic, um, walking into the British Museum, and you remember this from your visits, um, this is a global community you are in, and the Chinese are extremely present. Um, and I'm, I'm very happy to say, not only in the China section, um, of you know, of course, that is one of the glories of our museum, um, but also in all the other areas, Egypt and Greece and 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 India, and Europe. So it's really, I think, on all levels, um, there are close ties, and I think um, this partnership with the National Museum um, is really highlighting um, how closely we are connected. 这个确实是我在大英博物馆也看到很多的亚洲面孔的观众非常多这确实是一个特点但是相比之下呢中国国家博物馆这个从产品的结构来讲的话外国的文物很少外国产品很少那么这个这是我们的一个短板从中观众结
呃，这个外国文物部，我们希望能扩大对这个外国文物的征集。那么我最近也注意到，你们收藏了这个日本艺术家葛氏北斋的作品，呃，这个确实我很令我羡慕。呃，据报道说，你们那个呃大英博物馆收藏的这个呃葛氏北斋的作品超过一千幅，呃，这个这个我知道，做好这方面工作需要方方面面努力。我很想了解一下，呃，费舍尔的馆长在这方面有什么？呃，这个好的做法和经验，来给我们介绍一下。Yes, uh, this is a very fascinating story, obviously, and I think it's fascinating for each and every museum to understand how objects ended up in the museum.、Um, and of course, we both know that museums have actually really started. Uh, to acquire works only in the 19th century. Before that, museums were repositories of collections that were donated, basically.、Um, so, from the 19th century on,、um, museums themselves have developed strategic collecting、um, approaches,、um, thinking about. What they want to highlight, what they want to focus on, and I think the best collections are those which were created by people who really knew how to make decisions and choices and say, "We want to strengthen this part of the collection. We're not going to look at this or the other because this is what our main focus is."、Um, and of course, the British Museum、um, has benefited from. People who've been passionate about other cultures and、um, who were curious and who had also the stamina to go out and do archaeological research, do excavations, or engage with other communities. And but I think what we need to keep in mind is that collections always. Grow out of the passion of some people, the knowledge, the expertise, the love of some people who want to know, who want to bring together groups of objects and groups of works that allow future generations to show what a region in the world or a certain period in history looked like, and that, you know, with all the Vicissitudes and and you have to have luck too, and you have to attract collections.、Um, in the end, creates what we know of, you know, of of our collections, either in the National Museum,、um, which of course has that function of representing the nation, major National Museum, and the British Museum. You know, there's a joke. Uh, uh, the British Museum's name. You know, why is it called British Museum?、Uh, because the British part in the museum is not that big. It's it's quite important too,、um, but it's really a museum about world culture and two million years of of human history spanning the entire globe. And for us, and I come back to 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 our cooperation. It is very important that more and more、um, we can enhance the access to this collection, that we can share this collection. So, being able to work with you and、um, having objects travel to the National Museum, where you put up beautiful shows with a great audience,、um, is extremely important. It's a vital part、um, of our activity. 对，我我觉得。大家经常说的一句话，就是或者是大英对自己的大英博物馆对自己的这个使命的或愿景的一个描述，就是世界文明的荟萃之地。呃，确实是各方面的各个国家、东西方的呃发达国家、发展中国家的这种文化都在这里面呃有一种呈现，有一种交流，有一种呃荟萃。呃，但是我也我也注意到您最近呃有一个有一个接受媒体采访的时候有一句话。呃，说是大英博物馆创始人汉斯·斯隆爵士，呃，因其奴隶主的身份
，呃，他的半身的雕像已经换了个位置。呃、您当时说汉斯·斯隆曾经是一名奴隶主，我们已经把他放下了神坛，呃，我们不能隐瞒任何事情。当涉及到历史的时候，忠于事实绝对是至关重要的。我们追求的目标是还原和直面我们共同的复杂的。有的时候是非常痛苦的历史，呃，我确实想着了解一下，呃，你当时谈这个话的时候是一个什么样的真实的想法<笑> ？Well, first of all, I must say that、um, we took the bust of Hans Sloane, which、um, sat on a pedestal in the what we call the Enlightenment Gallery,、um, and and of course at the National Museum, you remember. Um, the, the the Enlightenment exhibition. So what what we do in this ex, in this、um, gallery is to show the the period between say 1680 and 1820, when、um, from a European point of view,、um, scholars, researchers、um, would set out to、um, From their vantage point, to explore the world and to come up with new forms of thinking, of、um, research, of verifying results,、um, of let's say、um, the relation to truth,、um, which is based on facts, corroborated facts, on categorizing the whole world of knowledge in a new way. And Hans Sloane,、um, who was born in 1660 and died 93 in 1753, was part of that movement. He was a medical doctor,、um, a natural scientist. He was friend of he was a friend of Isaac Newton, and in fact, he became his successor as the head of the Royal Society here in London.、Um, Sloan、uh, brought together the biggest private collection, the biggest encyclopedic private collection,、um, which has been created. And at the end of his life, he offered this collection to、um, the British Parliament, saying, "You can have it. You have to buy it, but I I sell it at a very low price." So there was a strong aspect of donation.、Um, Involved in this, provided that you make it accessible to everybody. He he says to the studious and the curious, the specialists and the general public, of charge, and that you keep that collection together, because that collection, which covers natural history, human history, and which also comprised a huge library, which then became the library.、Um, Covered all areas of knowledge,、um, in his understanding. Now, as a young man, so Hans Sloane is a physician, a very important physician of his time, a very important scholar, a very important collector, and a very important benefactor. And what we have done now, coming out of research that we have done over these last years. On the history of our own collection, so where did people collect the objects? How were they collected? How did they enter the museum? Because we need clarity and transparency、uh, on these questions.、Um, in this context, we also wanted to highlight that Sloan, as many people of his time,、um, was a slave owner, and that he.、Um, Own shares in companies that traded、um, slaves that brought enslaved and slave Africans from West Africa to the Caribbean and and to what is today the U.S. So as this, you know, taking him off the pedestal, putting him in a showcase, and putting as we do in museums, we work with objects. So we argue, if you like, with objects and then explain the objects. And this is what we did. We put Sloan in the context of his time, and aside from his、um, many merits, we also 
wanted to highlight for our audiences those aspects of Anne Sloan that for us today are unacceptable. For, for us, obviously, um, a breach, a profound breach of all human rights to enslave people, which, by the way, is not only a problem of us, it's also a problem of the present. So here we are with Hans, um, who's a key figure in the history of our museum, but with a fuller historical appraisal of who he was, what he did. Uh, and I think it's in relation to this that I said, we have to have a dedication to truthfulness, which is to say, we have to address all the things that we are aware of and that we can research. And we have to understand that all our histories are complex histories, which have difficult sides, and as I said, at times, not painful sides. And I think it's important that as a community, address these questions and engage in dialogue with audience, um, around the world. Those who come to the museum and those who engage with the museum from afar um, by a digital forum. That's the background um, of the of Hans Sloan. It's, not, it's very important to understand. If not, it's in the way, we just put him in a different context within the Enlightenment gallery. Uh, 确实直面历史是非需要非常巨大的一个勇气 一些经验，呃，确实我经常说，大英博物馆确实是人类文明的荟萃之地，在这方面名不虚传。那么，人类历史本身就是一幅这种不同文明相互交流啊、借鉴呐、融合的这么一幅历史。所以我很希望在文明
of an ever-growing um, connection globally is irreversible. Um, it will grow. It will become ever more important. It will mark our lives ever more profoundly. And of course, technology plays an important part in that. But we, as we see today, as we're witnessing um, the, in these years, um, history doesn't go down one route as expected. It takes turns. It um, goes backwards, perhaps, at least in our perception, to then take another leap. So I think we are in a fascinating period of time with a lot of new challenges, with a lot of new opportunities. And I think, Director Wang, the, the, the possibility to work together, um, the colleagues from the National Museum and the colleagues from the British Museum, is a huge chance to have an impact on this development. And as you suggest, um, what we are able to show is that there are many interconnections between cultures. Not only are there many interconnections between cultures, these interconnections, the interconnectedness of cultures has actually driven the, the development of humankind. And I think our museums, with the, the depth of, of connections, and that means also the depth of history, that, um, that you can showcase um, um, in Beijing, that we can showcase in London, um, really makes us understand that. But we have to bring this out. It's not self-evident. As always, you know, obje objects encapsulate a lot of stories, but we have to tell these stories. We have to narrate them. So your suggestion, I think, is wonderful um, to bring together works from different cultures. In this case, you say two, could be more, and understand how each culture has actually, take portraits as an example, conceived of the individual. You know, who is the individual? What is an individual? How does the individual express herself or himself? And how is the individual integrated into society? And of course, we will find out that there are different ways of thinking about this, different ways of thinking about the interior world of an individual, different ways of thinking about social responsibility. And, and bringing paintings or, or, or portraits together, and that can be sculptures, can be many things, would highlight that. It would, you know, it would, it would allow us to go from one to the other, to bridge the, the, the distance, if you like, and in bridging it, translating from one culture to the other. And I think that is really the key task of, of our institutions, to offer to our visitors that possibility of engaging in dialogue and offering translations between, between cultures. Welcome to the British Museum. It's a great pleasure to take you round our galleries and to show you some of the most famous, some of the most beautiful, and some of the most fascinating objects in our collection. But before we do that, I would like to have a look at this inscription, which is placed right when you come into the museum, into the Great Court. It's a posing space at the center, at the heart of the museum, with this enormous roof. And what you see here in the ground is from a poem by Alfred Lord Tennyson, one of the greatest poems of the United States Kingdom in the 19th century. And it says, And let thy feet millennium's heads be set in midst of knowledge. And it is addressing you, the visitors, 
inviting you to engage with the objects, the cultures from around the world, from the depth of history, the depth of time, and to discover what speaks to your heart, what speaks to your mind, what is really meaningful for you, and then take it with you as you move on for millenniums hence and use it for yourself, for your friends, for your family. Discuss it, debate it, think about it, dream about it, and just make it your own. Let me show you one of the most popular, one of the most visited objects in the British Museum. It's a Rosetta Stone right in front of us here in the showcase. And it has a fascinating story to tell. In fact, it has many fascinating stories to tell. It was um, put up in 196 um, uh, BCE at a temple, probably in Sais. It tells us about um, the temple um, uh, setting up a cult for the pharaoh, the young Ptolemy uh, V. And it tells us the story in three different types of script. At the top, you have hieroglyphs which is ancient traditional writing system of Egypt. In the middle, you have the same text written in Demotic, which was the everyday writing system or script. At the bottom, you have the same text, this time in Greek. The stone was seized in 1801. In 1802, it entered the British Museum. And today, it sits right in the center of the Grand Egyptian Gallery. As soon as the Rosetta Stone entered the British Museum, copies were made and they were distributed among the learned societies of Europe and North America, triggering, triggering a race to decipher the hieroglyphs. In 1822, the young French Egyptologist Champollion published his book on the hieroglyphs. That was the moment when suddenly, with the deciphering of the hieroglyphs, all of the ancient Egyptian past became accessible. Scholars could read the texts of buildings of Pyrrhi, and that exploded our knowledge and understanding of ancient Egypt. So this stone tells a very complex story, mixing religion, faith, politics, culture, the understanding of the past, and the way we can build bridges between languages and between epochs. It's all about translation, and that is what actually the museum is about. It helps you to translate cultures from other regions, cultures from other times, into your own language, and allows you to activate them as your own resource, as your own cultural resource, wherever they come from. We're standing here next to a Lamassu. The Lamassu is a winged bull, sometimes a lion, with human hair, wearing a crown, and around the crown, we see horns indicating that this is a divinity. Lamassu stood at the entrances to citadels and palaces in the um, Assyrian uh, Empire, in palaces of the king, to protect the ruler. This Lamassu was excavated in Kosovo at the um, the capital of Simon II, who ruled from 721 to 705 BC. And it tells you something about the power, the might um, of this empire and its rulers. There's something very special about this one, the Muslim, and that's what I would like to show you uh, right here. As is very often the case with Assyrian sculpture and reliefs, 
you have in scriptures um, telling, um, telling, telling us what this is about, who put them up, under whose rule they were created, who commissioned them, and so on and so forth. So this is highly official court art. And it is, and it is to communicate that this is the place of the ruler and that he has the support of the gods. But of course, all this is placed right in the middle of daily life. And it's daily life that we find a very touching trace, uh, a trace of when we look close um, at the cliff. And as you see here, just next to one of the hoofs of the uh, bull, and you can admire how finely sculpted um, these massive sculptures were. But right here, you have scratched into the stone a game board. And this must have been scratched into the stone by the sentinels who had to guard the entrance to the citadel. And doing this day in, day out, they must have been bought to pieces. So what did they do? Well, they were used to playing this game, and this is a very ancient game. It's been played in Mesopotamia since 2500 BC. So these sentinels said, that's a game. Nobody's watching, we're on our own. They scratched the game board into the rock, into the stone, and had a go. And this tells you something about the collection of the British Museum. You have grand art that speaks of empires, conquest, high art, culture, sophistication. And you also have those simple objects, the traces of the human hand of everyday life of, as we would call it, normal people, not the rulers, not those who would call the shots um, and decide on the fate of the empire. But you just had to make a living every day, like the sentinels. And that is a monument to those sentinels that we have right here at the foot of this giant sculpture. In 2017, we renovated our biggest gallery, the Hojan Gallery, and added digital um, content, digital technology, to enhance our visitors' experience and to make them engage even more ways with the objects in the collection. The following film will take you right into the center of a beautiful 17th century Chinese scroll.
try to produce films that tell the stories, the many stories of the objects uh, in our collection. Let me introduce you to my colleague Jessica Harrison Hall, who is now going to talk about the subtle differences in Ming porcelain. Hello, I'm Jessica Harrison Hall and I'm a specialist in Ming ceramics and welcome to my corner. Today I'm going to talk to you about Ming ceramics. The Ming Dynasty in China runs from 1368 to 1644 and I have before me a selection of blue and white ceramics that were made in Jingdezhen between 1368 and 1644. This saucer dish was made at the time of the Hongwu Emperor. Now he conquered the Mongols and established the Ming Dynasty in 1368. And he has an extraordinary life story. At one stage he was so poor he had to beg for land to bury his parents. And yet by the time he was 40, he was son of heaven and ruling all of China. And during his reign, supplies of cobalt to make the underglazed blue design was interrupted and so blue and white wares during his reign have a much weaker tone because they used the imported cobalt quite sparingly or mixed it with local cobalt. So what we're looking at here is a rather beautiful saucer. Originally it would have had a cup set in the centre here and it has a very a stiff bracketed edge, and this is reminiscent of metalwork. We find these dishes made in silver and gold with this same bracket lobed rim. And then inside, can you see you've got these lotuses that are shown sometimes from above and sometimes in profile. And what's particularly clever is you can see that there are some areas where they left white around the petal and that creates a kind of three-dimensionality to the flower. So each of these flowers have been painted with a very fine brush and you can pick out all the different details in the flower. It's really quite exquisite. The second ceramic that we're going to look at was made in the Yongle period. Now this is the high point for blue and white Ming porcelain. He ruled between 1403 to 24, and he was the emperor that moved the capital from Nanjing north to Beijing. And he instigated a real change at Jingdezhen where these porcelains were produced. So you get porcelains made with a much finer prepared body clay and more beautiful glaze. And you can see, if you look closely at the flowers here, which are all peonies, that the actual um, blue is used to sculpt the flower. So there are certain areas that are white, certain areas that are pale blue, and certain areas that are dark blue. And if we look very, very closely, you can see some which are black, where the blue has really come all the way through the glaze. So one of the things about Yongle period early 15th century blue and white porcelain is that you have these sculpted flowers. Each of the leaves makes sense in the pattern and this, these particular flowers have these crinkle edged leaves. And you may be wondering why is it in this shape and that's because again it's copying a metalwork form. It's not natural in ceramic to have these little hooks on the top of the handle. And you have to imagine that originally it would have had a cover and that from the knob on the top of the cover that would have connected a chain to the top of the handle. And this strut here is entirely unnecessary for the ceramic but would have helped support the spout. 
in the gold original. And when we turn around and look at the base of the handle, you've got these three tiny, almost like nails, these studs, which would have fixed the metal handle to the body. It's very, very beautifully painted. And you can see it has a much whiter glaze surrounding the blue than the Hongwu piece. This is probably one of the most precious Ming ceramics that we have on the table today. Moving on to our third example, this was made in the mid-15th century. And what's interesting about this is you start to get fabulous designs from woodblock prints. So if we start off on this example, we begin with this building here, with these typical Chinese roof edges that are upturned at the edge. Inside, you can see a scholar waiting with a bottle of wine, and his servant is pointing out to the procession of people who are coming to see him. The first servant is carrying a sword over his shoulder, and the second has a musical instrument wrapped in silk called a chin. After them come the scholars themselves, mounted on horseback, with these fabulous black hats that have these wings at the side. Each one has a rank badge on his chest, and their horses are bedecked with fabulous uh, bridles and saddles, uh, trimmed with a pom-pom on the nose. Behind the three scholars, we have two more servants. One who is bringing a shoulder pole with two picnic baskets attached. Each of the layers here would have contained different delicacies, all contained within stacking lacquer boxes. And his friend behind him comes with two wine jars full of delicious wine for their feast. And they're followed right at the end with a, another servant carrying a stack of books. And then the scene comes to an end with these sort of clouds. That's how we know it's the beginning and the end of the scene. So how were these made? They're fashioned from porcelain clay, thrown on a wheel, and then painted uh, with cobalt oxide in solution, which when you paint it on, appears black. After you've let it dry, you cover it with a clear glaze and then fire it at a high temperature. These are fired in wood-fueled kilns that snake up the side of mountains in the southern part of China, near the city of Jingdezhen. And so, because of this snaking form that undulates up the hillside, they're referred to as dragon kilns. You might be wondering what the jar is for. It's effectively a large container for wine. So originally it would have had a cover. And we see these in paintings sitting on the floor. And from this, wine would have been taken and then put into smaller vessels, like this decanter or bottles. The next item on the table is this box which was made for the Longqing Emperor, who really only ruled for five or six years, between 1567 and 72. So this beautiful square box is interesting because it has this pattern of two dragons. You can see the heads here, and then the curling bodies that run all the way through with the five clawed feet and they're chasing this flaming pearl amongst the clouds. And then the edges, each edge has got a different dragon around the edge on the four sides. And then underneath we've got a box with four compartments Again, each of the compartments is outlined with a blue line. The edges are unglazed, and then inside they're filled with glaze. And each of the edges has a roundel with a dragon. 
rather like the robes of a, an emperor. These come from textile designs and there are 12 of them around the outside. The first piece that we've come across in the selection that has a rain mark and yet we're always talking about mark and period Ming porcelain. The rain marks themselves are generally made up of six characters, sometimes of four. The first two have the name of the dynasty, Great Ming. The second two have the name of the rain period. And then the last two are year and made in. So it's made in the year of and then the particular emperor's name. Blue and white wasn't invented in the Ming dynasty. Blue and white goes much further back in Chinese history. And the first blue and white porcelains were made during the Yuan era. Uh, that's 1280 to 1368. And when we think of blue and white, we don't think of Yuan blue and white. We think of Ming blue and white because that's the era in which blue and white porcelain came to Europe. First of all, through the Portuguese and later the Dutch and the English. And when the p blue and white arrived in Europe, it transformed the way people dined and it transformed interiors. If you think of laying out a table with pewter and with wood, it's all very dark and the ceramics at the time generally had lead glazes. So in Europe, they would have been greens and browns and rather dull colors. And then along comes something like this dish, which was made um, for export and shipped in large quantities uh, to Holland and Portugal and England. And it would have transformed interiors by the light reflecting off the dish. So you can imagine a, a more um, you know, multicolored interior. And the patterns, too, were much more interesting. So very quickly in Europe, people started copying these designs. Uh, all sorts of ceramics manufacturers right across uh, Europe. Here we have a piece which was produced for the export market right at the end of the Ming Dynasty in 1643. This has got a bracket-lobed rim like the first dish that we looked at, but it's much coarser. In the centre, you've got the crow with the open mouth, or the bird with the open mouth, this giant tree peony, and then in the carvetto, this sort of panel design with alternating flowers and lingja fungus. Now, these are a kind of fungus or mushroom which bestowed immortality on an individual. If we turn it over, we can see that it's been rather roughly made. It's been fired on its foot ring and has a lot of grit adhering to it. And in the centre, you can see these chatter marks, which are like the spokes on the wheel of a bicycle. That's very typical of this uh, late material. This came from a shipwreck discovered an, uh, in the 1980s and it's lain at the bottom of the South China Sea for 300 years. And that's why when you look at it, it has a very matte feel to it. We can't see the same kind of glossy glaze that we see on the earlier Ming pieces. Discovered in the 1980s and was sold to the museum in 1985. It was one of 23,000 pieces on board. Thank you for watching this brief introduction to the British Museum. If you liked it, please visit our Chinese language website. There you will also find collection online with many entries on famous objects in Chinese. And please follow us on Weibo and WeChat um, and discover our bespoke content. We very much hope to welcome you to the British Museum. Thank you so very much for having me. It was great talking to you. All the best. So, see you then.